We are looking at our series of called, things that we are called to are seven value statements uh, that we have developed for our congregation. Our sixth one says this, we are called to share our resources generously to build God's kingdom. Now this is an important one and there, there are several key words in there for us, but this can be hard for us. This is a place where a lot of us get stuck. This idea that somehow I'm supposed to share, and not just share, but share generously, something within us begins to kind of close up here just a little bit. But if we want to push forward, this is something we have to look at as followers of Jesus. But we begin with this question, why? Why do we even talk about sharing? Why would we share? Let me give you two important principles about who we are as followers of Jesus. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. There's a key there word that I want you to grab a hold of because what we see is that as followers of Jesus, we are stewards, not owners. A steward works for someone else. They manage someone else's stuff. They don't own it themselves. And so often we think of all the things we have, we think of ourselves as owners rather than that God is the owner and we are his stewards. You know, if you've been around toddlers very much, you know they have their own unique property laws. You ever notice that? And it goes something like this. From a toddler's perspective, if I like it, it's mine. If it's in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. If I had it a little while ago, it's still mine. If it's mine, it must never, ever appear to be yours in any way. If I'm doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. If it looks just like mine, it is mine. If I saw it first, it's mine. If you are playing with something and you put it down, it automatically becomes mine. If it's broken, it's yours. (laughs) If you get nothing else from this message, get this, don't be a toddler when it comes to stuff. So we're stewards, we're not the owners. Here's another few words. These are from Jesus. Jesus is looking out at the the crops, the fields, and he says this, the harvest, the harvest, that is people, people's souls, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So the other thing that we see here, we're not only just stewards instead of owners, we are harvesters, not consumers. We're harvesters, not consumers. You know, sometimes you grow things for your own benefit. You're you're going to eat it or you're, you're going to sell it, but ultimately it's about you. And so often we see our church work as about us, ours. We build buildings and we add staff and we buy material. Why? Well, for us, to take care of us, for us to consume. And while we do need some elements to help us equip and encourage, ultimately we need to see that we're not in the harvesting business. We're in the wrong business. We are about bringing people in to the kingdom of heaven. Not about just taking care of ourselves. And it's so easy for a congregation to lose sight of that. And to slip into maintenance mode. And to think about what makes us comfortable, what pleases us, rather than about what pleases the Father and what reaches out into the harvest field. So that's why we do it. Now, let me get you to think about something else here. 
And that is about our resources. And what resources do we each have? Because we share our resources. And what do we have? Listen to Paul as he writes in Romans chapter 12. He says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Now the context of this, what he's speaking to is a church that was very divided. And one of the things they were divided on was the spiritual gifts that people had. And some people thought their spiritual gift was better than the other. But what we can pull out of here and take away for this moment is this idea that we all have gifts or abilities, whatever you like to call them. And we'll, we'll wrap it up into this one word, talents. Each one of us has unique talents. Something that we can bring to the table. We just came away from Thanksgiving, and if you can think about a Thanksgiving meal that you put out there, and someone brings the meat, and someone brings the salads, and someone brings the vegetables. I don't know why, but somebody brings the potatoes and the dressing, and they, everybody brings something unique that they make, that they like, and that they contribute to the whole. And you have some talents that you have, that God has wired into you or he's given you through his spirit and, and only you can use them in the way that you can use them and make the difference that you can make. I want to read you a story from Acts chapter 9. And the church has been born and now it's growing and it's moving out and it's gone from Jerusalem, out into Judea, and it's, it's been working its way. And now there are churches out on the coast of Israel. And we read this. In one of the towns, a town on the coast called Joppa, there was a disciple named Tamitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. Interesting, we don't see that name continue on, isn't it? She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Now, Peter was in Lydda, and so Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Well, why? Well, because they knew Peter was doing some miraculous things. They thought, Let, maybe we can get Peter here to do something and so Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. And there, here's what I want you to see. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with him. Do you see what happened here? She used the talent that she had to serve others. And look what happens next. Peter sent them all out of the room, then he got down on his knees, and he prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet, and he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. Now, the takeaway here is not this, that if you make clothes for widows, if you die, you'll get brought back to life. That's not the lesson. The lesson here is the impact this woman made in the lives of other people for the kingdom using the talent she had. She was not an upfront person. She wasn't standing on a stage. She was just doing what she could with what she had for the sake of others. So what talent do you have? I've got a couple that I'm going to ask to come up here. This past August, Steve Spear with World Vision was here and uh, shared about their work. And one couple, Jake and Pam Martindale, were particularly challenged by this. And, and uh, they're going to talk about how they're going to use their talent to serve the Lord. Um, well, what we're 
What we're doing is, okay. <laughs> um, well, when Steve Spear was here, um, he told us about the run that he did across the country from LA to New York to raise money for clean water in Africa. And we're not gonna be doing that exactly. Um, we are doing a do-it-yourself event through World Vision where World Vision basically allows you to pick whatever race you wanna do and join them in fundraising. And so we are going to do a half marathon um, on March the 20th. 23rd and Carmel, and there's also a quarter marathon that some of our friends are joining us to do, and our goal is to raise uh, $10,000 for clean water. All right. And who else is involved so far? So Pam and I, um, my best friend growing up, CJ Buskirk, um, Troy and Brant Guthrie, and Rob Ratliff. You know, we looked at the question of why. Why are we doing this? So what's, have you got a why here for us? Yeah, so there's a, a couple reasons. Um, number one, uh, Pam and I um, had been sponsoring um, some children through World Vision since before we were married. Um, and when Steve was telling the story of how he, when he went and visited uh, his sponsored child, how she had to walk uh, a mile each way to get water and she did this three times a day um, and it really kind of hit us because our daughter was the same age um, and imagining her having to to get up and walk that far just to go get water um, really struck us. Is there another reason with that so, too? So the second reason um, is next year will be the 10 years since I had suffered cardiac arrest um, when I was training for a marathon. Um, it was, it'll be 10 years in July. Um, I was training and had done an 18 mile run on a Saturday and then that following Monday, um, Pam said when the alarm went off, I didn't get up, so, um, and I wasn't breathing, so she called 911, and luckily at the time, we only lived a mile from the fire station, um, so they were there within a few minutes um, and were able to shock me a few times to get my heart back. Um, and the thing that's been kind of humbling about that experience is I'd run 18 miles on Saturday, and when they, they'd put me in a drug-induced coma, and did hypothermia treatment and when they brought me out of that I had to use a walker to walk again. Um, so to go through that experience um, I didn't really learn it at the time um, but when Pam, Pam was the one that said you know she wanted to do something um, this year and run um, and I agreed but as I've been training, I've learned how selfish that I was during that time and my training and how much time I was away from home um, after working, not getting home till 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night and then going for my training runs um, was pretty selfish at the time. And, and now I've realized that you know we have this opportunity to do something to, to help others and to to spread the news of Jesus Christ, um, it puts a new perspective on, you know, the talents he gives us, we can use any of those talents to, to glorify him um, if we just invite him along with us. So what's, how can any of us be involved? Uh, well, there's three different ways we're asking for you guys to consider helping us out. Um, the first is to pray for us. Um, Brant is the only person on our team under the age of 40, so we really need a lot of prayer with our training just to be um, healthy and injury-free. Um, and also just uh, pray for the people who are going to be benefiting from the clean water that we're raising money for. Um, World Vision estimates that for every $50, it helps one person um, get clean water. So so hopefully we'll be helping at least 200 people get clean water through our um, fundraising. And so, um, so just be praying uh, for us. And um, the second 
thing is if anyone else would like to uh, run, it's not too late. It's 17 weeks um, until the race. You can either do a half marathon, which is about 13 miles, or a quarter marathon is about six and a half miles. Um, so we'd be happy to have you join our team if you feel led to do that. And then um, the final way is um, donations. This is a fundraising. The whole reason we're doing this is to raise the money for clean water. Um, we have a $10,000 goal, mostly um, uh, because we want to do like a thousand dollars for every year since Jake's cardiac arrest. That's kind of where we got the ten thousand from. Um, and you can donate um, either by looking us up on the Team World Vision dot org website. You can type in any of our names or our team name is called What Are You Waiting For? Um, and so <laughs> you can uh, donate with a credit card online or you can write a check to um, World Vision or you could give us some cash and we'll uh, make sure that it gets donated through our credit card. So. Question, is there a 126th marathon that you can run? <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> You know, if you're like me and your mind kind of stopped for a moment when you heard Jake say cardiac arrest uh, while training for racing, just let me point out results may vary, you know. So. Here's the thing. You hear that and go, I can't run. I'm, I'm past running. I, I can't do that. The, the point is not to do what they're doing in the sense of this particular thing. The point is to do something. What is it you can do? How can you use your talents to make a difference for the kingdom? Well, let's go on. It's not just our talents. There's something else. Let me take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul is writing, and the issue that's going on that he's addressing is they're, they're preparing to take up an offering to help the church back in Judea because of a famine. And he wanted to make sure that they were going to be ready for that offering when he arrived. And he's giving them, in a couple of chapters here, he's giving them some instructions and about their hearts and such. And he says this, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And what's he talking about here? He's talking essentially about their treasure, their money. And it does come to that. From time to time we have to confront this that scripture says a lot about our money and our relationship to that money. And not just our money, it's, it's our treasure is the stuff that we have, the things that we accumulate in our life. Now, what he's telling us here is not that you give in order to get so you have more, but rather you give and God restores what you need so you can continue the process of giving. God is looking for people to be conduits through which he can meet the various needs around the world. The problem is so much of it just stops with us. Now, notice his reference to generosity. Let's take a look at this passage. He says this a little earlier up in chapter 9. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now catch what he said there. It's not for me to tell you how much to give. It's not for the person next to you to do that. This is for you and God to wrestle out. But some of you aren't even getting in the ring. You're not even having conversations with God about this. And I want to encourage you to do this. To push yourself, to think about it, to pray about it, to read scripture and think about your relationship to the things that you have in your life. Let me give you another passage to consider. This is in uh, Ephesians 3. It says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people 
to grasp how wide and how long and how high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the fullness of God. Here's something we want to see, why we are called to be generous. Because we are called to be generous. Why? First off, because God is generous. We serve a generous God. And if our goal is Christ-likeness or godliness, we need to pursue generosity in our lives, to become a people who seek to be generous. Now let me give you a, a word from Jesus here. You've heard this before probably. Matthew 6, 21, wherever your treasure is, what does it say? There your heart will be also. It's about moving our heart. Listen to Proverbs 11. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. What's the takeaway here? Generosity is transformative. If you want to change, if you want to grow, if you want to mature, you have to confront the greed demon in your life, the selfishness in your life. And nothing will do that like pursuing generosity. I, w- I wonder if any of you like me are been feeling a, a holy kind of discontent in your life. That, that sense that not everything is not as it should be, that you kind of want more in your relationship with God. That you want something beyond what you're already experiencing. And, and I got to think about this, this season that we're in right now. You know, at one time, feasts were a really big deal for people because most of the time, in most of human history, people had just enough food. Ordinary people had just enough food for the day. If you had enough food, you were in, you were in pretty good, good situation. A lot of people didn't have enough food even for the, the day. But if you had just enough. So... When you had a celebration and you'd have a feast, that was a really big deal. You got to eat things you normally might eat. You got to eat a little bit more. Think about today where we're at. You can have a feast any day of the week. You can go down to Golden Corral and just strap on the the feed bag and just stay there all day and eat and eat and eat and eat. And our relationship to food has changed. And so now when we talk about a Thanksgiving meal, I don't know about you, but you kind of go, eh, I had that last week. You know, turkey, I've been trying to lose weight. I've been eating a lot of turkey lately. Something has changed in us. And so when we think about more, we, something has changed within us. You know, I find myself sometimes, uh, I'll go into the kitchen and I just start grabbing handfuls of food. You know, just a little bit of time. Here's a handful of peanuts and then a second handful of peanuts. And Angie will stop and she'll say, are you eating because you're hungry? And I'll say to her, shut up, let me be. (laughs) No, I would never, I would never say that. I I like living in my house. And I think, no, I'm not. I'm bored. I'm discontent. There's some emotional thing going on. I've found in my life that if I feel anxious about something, something stirs up some anxiety, one of the first things I do is make a beeline for some food. And all of that just gives us that kind of stuffed, malaise feeling. You know, and and that happens. Maybe you had that this this past week. Once, maybe twice, three times, depending on how many dinners you went to. You know, you're just just after dinner and you're kind of patting the bell. Oh, man, I... I'm stuffed. That was a good, good meal. Ooh, pie. Yeah, I'll take some more. <laughs> but what if we, we feel that every single day and you just after will, wow, you feel bloated. And it's not just with food. We're doing that with all sorts of stuff. Nothing's hardly special to us anymore because we have everything. And we're bloated spiritually. We get, we get, and we get, we take, we take, and we take, but we don't give. We don't share. 
So we need to let generosity begin to transform us in our relationship with things. Now here's something else I want you to see. The kingdom transcends local congregations. Why? Let's talk about the kingdom for just a moment. The kingdom of heaven transcends local congregations. Now, I want you to think about this. A guy by the name of Jim Botts wrote about kingdom people versus church people. And let me just sum up some of the things that he says. First off, he says that church people, and we need to think about, are we church people or are we kingdom people? Church people often can't see past church-bound categories for ministry. Usher, greeter, children's worker, inviter of lost friends, etc., Kingdom people, on the other hand, have a kingdom vision to think, dream, and act outside the box or the church. They want to heal the wounds in their neighborhood, their workplace, the community, the issues of fatherlessness and addictions and marriages that are in trouble. They want to make an impact and bring the kingdom into people's lives. Church people see the gospel in terms of good news about the afterlife. Kingdom people see the gospel in terms of good news about kingdom life about life with God now and forever. Church people understand discipleship is primarily about enjoying a closer relationship with God that grows us into spiritual maturity. But kingdom people, on the other hand, understand discipleship as the call to lose their life for Christ's sake so they can participate in his family for his mission. So are you a kingdom person? For a church person. And we here as a congregation have to make sure that we are pursuing the kingdom life, not the church life. About maintaining ourselves, keeping the status quo, making a comfortable place for us and our families versus making an impact in our environment around us, our world around us, our people around us. Let me share a couple of parables with you from Jesus. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. They told him another one. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Now, what's he saying here? He's telling us that the kingdom of heaven is dynamic, not static. That is, it's growing, not staying as one size, one place. It's moving, growing things. Last weekend, if you were here, you know I wasn't here. I was uh, spent uh, last weekend at our international conference on missions. And it was in Cincinnati this year. And I got to tell you, it was something, it was just refreshment for my heart. And I got reminded about the powerful things that are going on in the kingdom around the world. So often when we think about missionaries, you think about somebody going off and they're, they're sharing with this tribe or that tribe or in this city or that city. Well, let me tell you, there's some exciting things that people are doing. They're taking care of widows and orphans and, and building churches around that. They're helping helping young women out of human trafficking and helping them to find productive jobs and so they can care for themselves. They're starting churches around the world. One of the things folks need to understand that the kingdom of heaven is not worried about color and it's not worried about language. The church is growing in some of the places, some of the poorest places in the world. Because people hear good news. We're told this day and age, the church has bad news for you. They want to inhibit your freedom. They want to hold you back from your potential. But around the world, people are hearing the good news of Jesus that is liberating them from their systems that have trapped them in both physical and spiritual poverty. And I don't want you, but I want to be a part of something like that. But I can't do that if I refuse to be generous, if I focus on myself rather than on others. So what should I do? What should you do? 
If the kingdom does not remain static, neither should you or I. So let me encourage you this. Take a step. I want you to encourage, think about taking a step. When we have volunteer opportunities, step forward. You know the old joke about the line, everybody's lined up, so I need a volunteer. And every, step forward if you volunteer, and everybody else except one guy steps backwards, leaving that poor person. Maybe that's you, you feel like, I don't know how I got stuck in this, this uh, ministry I'm in. I didn't even volunteer, but somehow I got roped into it. We don't want it to be like that. We want it to be because you tried it out. You found it. You might find, you know, that was all right. It was okay. I'll go try something else next time. Or you might find a ministry that you can fall in love with because you see how you can be generous with your time and your talent and your treasure and you can make a difference in this world. This is also going to require that you step out in faith. Faith looks at the evidence and goes to the next logical place, even though it's unseen. And it requires some courage and it requires some trust. I encourage you to think about stepping down in faith. You might step into regular giving. If you're not a regular giver, this is one of those places to start. If you are a regular giver, you might think about increasing it. What if you just said, okay, whatever I'm doing right now, I'm going to do 1% more of my income. I'm just going to take it there. That might be for here at Ellisville, or you might say, I'm going to do that for missions. Whatever works. Because it's ultimately about you being transformed by partnering along with other folks. Maybe if you sponsor a child, you add a second child in. Well, find something to do. And then just step up your involvement. Step it up. Take it to the next level, whatever it might be. We need to stop stuffing our spiritual faces with food that won't satisfy us. We we need to start giving again. We need to become conduits so that we can change into what God has destined us to be, created us to be, and so the world can hear the good news of Jesus Christ and what it means to be a follower of His for this life and for the life to come. Thanks for taking time out of your day to watch this week's message. I hope it really encouraged you in your own walk with God. If you heard anything in the message and you'd you'd like to speak with someone or if you'd simply like to connect with someone on staff, we'd be really excited to hear from you. Please feel free to contact us at the email address or phone number below. Otherwise, thanks for watching.